And so we got exploring two-footed primate change, right? So we're looking at bipedal primate transformation. Yeah. We are bipedal, right? We walk on two feet. Let's say I was an organism that walked on four feet. Who wants to use their language of prefix to change that? Let's say we're talking about a four-legged animal. Rather than biped, it would probably be what? Quad. Quadruped. Very nice, right? Quad. So um, that's a great segue for our star question. Um, whoops, I did the wrong thing there. Um, so if we've got two species that are similar, we can learn more about each one by looking at them side by side. Let's say we take two very familiar quadrupeds. Can all, the, can all the people in the room tell the difference between a cat and dog? Yes. All right, this is common, right? Most of us have this ability. Has it ever been around a small child and they call every animal the same thing? Yeah. Yeah. Like every animal's a dog or a cow or whatever, right? Yeah. Let's figure out why toddlers do this. So um, what are the similar features between a cat and a dog? What are things they have in common? Tail. Alvin. Hmm? Are they both covered in fur? Sure, what else? Tail, four feet. Quadrupedal, they're four legs. They've got a tail, right? Um, all right, so you know, they walk up for legs, they're covered in fur, they've got a tail, they are quadrupedal. Um, all right, so the, uh, what are, are there other things they have in common? Think more about just like animal commonalities. Whiskers? All right, they have whiskers, right? Little sensory organs that help them feel things their faces near. Um, please. They have ears, they have two ears as a matter of fact, right? They each have two ears. Um, other things that many animals have in common. They have a nose, right? And the nose has how many nostrils? Two. And they use this organ to smell, right? Um, are there any are there any fine students who remember which part of the brain processes smell and taste to stimulus? Frontal lobe. Just below the frontal lobe, right underneath it. Sounds like when things are built. Olfactory, right? Nice. A little review from last Friday's test. Um, all right, so um, now the thing is, if they've got all this stuff in common, they both got paws, they both got fur, they're both quadrupeds, they both got tails, they both got two eyes, two no, you know, two nostrils and ears. How can I tell them apart? What's different? Um, Please. Some features. animals have like I don't know. Like just, we'll we'll like keep it at cats and dogs for now. We're, like, we're, so, we're, we're just trying to compare these two things. How can I tell them apart? Their ears bigger than the other. All right, might be the size of their ears. Sure. Um, what else? Nothing. Yeah. How far they can smell. All right, so maybe it's part of their olfactory sense, right? How far away they can smell something. Sure. Um, how they um, communicate. The vocalization, their communication. Diana, is that what you had to? I have. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe it comes back. Just yell it out, right? Right, so they have so much in common, but we have the ability to tell them apart. Just like I can look out in this room, you guys all have two ears, two eyes, a nose or two nostrils, and a mouth. But I can tell you apart how? Skin. All right, different skin tones, right? The coloration of your skin. But, uh, but some of you have similar skin tones, right? Do, could we agree with that, that some of you are generally speaking the same color? Yeah. You know, some people in the room, right? How can I then further tell you apart? Tell me what your nose is. Maybe the size of the nose or? How pointy it is. How pointy it is, the shape of it, right? Very nice. Let's say I draw just kind of an ambiguous animal head shape, right? And on one side, I put this ear. And on the other side, I put this ear. Is one a cat ear and one a dog ear? Alright, not so, but what are some features that might cue us off? Christine, you want to try it out? Please. Oh. No. Might, might we guess that one is the other? Yeah, please. Alright, so cat ears, that's really good, right? Cat ears tend to be pointy, whereas dog ears tend to have more of a curl. Or do you want to say more? Oh, no, I was about to say the eye color. Alright, it could be, it could be a coloration thing, right? Yeah. But are there some dogs and cats that are similar in coloration? Yeah. yeah. Is size an indicator of whether you're a dog or a cat? Yeah. No. Are there cats that are bigger than dogs? Yeah. Are there dogs that are smaller than cats? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure, right? If I have a lion and a, a chihuahua, right? Are, which one's bigger? The lion, 
chain, right? So cats are sometimes bigger than dogs. So like we know size and name. It's down to the features. Let's say I do another little drawing um, to impress, amaze, and astound my students who've been working so hard all day um, and doing the right thing and being good people. Um, can't we tell that one of these is a dog and one of these is a cat? Yeah. Yes. What are the differences? Please. Does anyone know what that part's called? The beak? The yeah, the beak, the, so the the beak if it's a bird, if it's a snout or a muzzle, if it's a dog or a cat, right? Great. The muzzle on the dog is kind of a rectangle. It's longer than it is tall. Whereas on our cat, it's more cuboidal. It's more like a square. Great. It's like a bird. Right. Um, yeah. are, are there other indicators between the cat and the dog? The ears. The ears, right? Cats tend to have pointy ears. And even if the dog has an ear that stands up, generally dog ears are curved, right? So curved versus pointy. Awesome. So this is kind of the nitpickiness that we talk about in science. And we call that, a word you guys have been learning in all of your classes, um, come on, all struggles. Um, we call that evidence, right? So I look at those things, and because the ear is pointy, it's a cat. Because the muzzle is long, it's a dog. Great. And everyone who wanted to have a chance to sign up for honors. Measures. 
Anybody? Volume? Inside. If the inside blank. Um, so that's done with me that's done with the meter. Space, volume measures about space something takes up, right? It's a measurement. I can say safely that inside this cup, there is X volume of space, right? A certain amount of fluid can fill it, a certain amount of air can fill it. Um, fill it. All right. Evidence also has to be observable, meaning that for a scientist to write something down as being true, as a fact, that means that you have to be able to... scientific, the ability for others to do the same thing as you. When you guys make your science fair boards, why do you write your process and procedure on the board? Why is your method there? So people know what you did to do to get the answer. Great, right? So they could take your board, your procedures, they could take it home, they could run your experiment and get the same result, and that would make it true, because they could observe it as well. They don't take your word for it. Um, all right, so now once you have some evidence, you can make inferences. And hopefully folks are noticing that this has popped up in other classes, right? right? Because we are an evidence-based argumentation school, and EBA is a major goal for the, our community, um, we're making sure that everyone absolutely has this, whether classes you missed or whatever shuffling you've done. Um, so an inference is a conclusion based on logical evidence. Now, when I say inference, what I'm saying is I don't know 100% for sure but based on the stuff that I've got, I can be pretty sure, right? So let's say, you know, we'll go back to our like crime drama scenario, right? Let's say I find a gun, right? And the gun has certain fingerprints on it. And those certain fingerprints belong to a person who hated the person that was now dead, right? I wasn't there to see the murder victim get shot. Yes. Oh, never mind. Oh, feel free if it comes to you, right? But based on those things, can I reliably, yeah. But the thing is, you could have a fingerprint on something, but your fingerprint don't show up in the data in the computer if you're a or anything, you don't pop up. Right, so first off, there has to be a database to use that for, right? But we're saying that like I caught you know, I caught the, we caught this person who was like fleeing the scene, right? We took their fingerprints, we found their fingerprints on the gun. We know that they hated the person who's now dead. No one was in the room, no one saw this thing happen, but can we make the inference that they did it? Yeah. No, you can, but it's you not can, enough. but you don't know 100% for sure, right? And this is a huge part of what science has to do, right? No one was there a million years ago to know how like the continent of America formed, but, Based on the movement of you know mountains right now and the things we know, we just make an inference. All right, let's say, let's say that the bus you take um, passes through or stops at um, Dudley Square, and you see somebody in a business suit get off the 66 at eight in the morning, transfer to the Silver Line. Tell me what you think about their story. Why? Right, all right, so you're, you know, you're, at, you're at Dudley Square, someone emerges from the 66, they're wearing a suit, they've got a briefcase, they step off the 66, they get onto a Silver Line bus. They're going downtown? All right, you know because of their Silver Line, they're going downtown, if they're in the suit, you think they're going to? They're probably going to work, right? Like, that's an inference. Did you interview that person? No. Did you, like, follow them and make sure they went to work? No, but like you can make up the story, right? You can say like, yeah, that's probably where they were going based on the things that I've seen. Um, all right, so. Um, now, all of this, ha the evidence stuff has to do with adaptations and evolution. So generally speaking, in organisms, organisms have a set of things known as adaptations. An adaptation 
is any of the individual's inherited characteristics, things that they got through their genetics from their parents, or maybe even learned, um, that's helped them survive or succeed. Um, now, a lot of these adaptations happened in animals long before recorded history, before humans were there to see it. But we still know some stuff, right? What are some adaptations aquatic animals have? Animals that live in the water. Yeah. Sure. And what tool do they have that helps them get like deep? Fins, right? Um, chameleons, like they have, um, like they change colors, so like they can adapt to any colors. So they can transform into their surrounding, right? Now we weren't there when like the first fish had fins, right? But we can we can figure out that well based on fin. If I find an animal in a box somewhere and it's got fins and it's got a gill slit. I'm pretty much sure that it lives in the water, right? Because I know that that's the tool that helps it survive. Now, if enough organisms in that population have that tool, um, what do you want to do next time? Um, we'll get there. We'll make sure you see. Um, all right, so the uh, evolution is when enough of the organism have this thing. So it's not just an individual. Now, um, has anybody ever seen the movie Waterworld? It's like 20 years old, but it's a sci-fi, something amazing. Yeah. You saw it? Yeah. Tell, tell me anything you remember about it. I remember, like, the dude from being underwater really long. Nice, right? Yeah. yeah um Great, right, right? So in this movie, in this Waterworld film, the main character was born with an adaptation. Unlike everybody else, he was a human with webbed feet. He had some like gill slits. Um, so now he's had an appropriate response here, right? That's abnormal. We say, ew, mutant. But if all if global warming happens and all the ice on the planet melts, what's gonna happen to the land? It's gonna get flooded and covered with water. So that person would be able to survive better than you or I would. And let's say that person born with those webbed feet does really well, right? He's really successful. He can like catch the most food. Um, how are the ladies going to feel about him? Yeah, they're going to want to get some of that, right? And they're going to have babies with him. And then all those babies are going to have gills and webbed feet, right? And then as many years go by, they have babies and their babies have babies. And before you know it, everyone's got Gills and webbed feet, right? Yeah, Hiram. So, what, what, he's the only person who has webbed feet, right? So, we were saying, yeah, in this film, right, he was the first born with this mutation. But by the end of the movie, of course, he's like the hero. And, you know, we would assume that. So, um, like, let's just say, like, 100 years and everybody has webbed feet. It takes a lot longer than that. But, yeah, because we're a slow growing species. But, um,. But that would be the case, right? We 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 think that he would make his babies would have it, and his babies' babies would have it. What are what are like, like, like he doesn't want to have Good. babies. Then that trait dies with him. Now, however, those of you who are going to be doing internships at Brigham's or Mass General next year will come discover that there are babies born today, right now, with little little web little extra webbing, or maybe a little a little. Well, yeah, I know somebody that right? has that. Yeah, and um, it doesn't really help us survive right now, but even still, if, if your child were born with a little extra webbing between their fingers, and the doctor offered you a surgery to remove that at birth, would you do it? Yeah. Why might you decide to do it? To look normal, so no one picks on you, right? You don't want to be like that oddball, but if the world was covered in water and your child had webbed feet, Right, you'd be like, just like the lion, be like holding your child up for everyone's yeah. like, look, next stage of evolution. Um, all right, so let's talk about this in reference to a um, scenario. So you can take a look at these animals and take a moment to answer this question. Um, I'll so folks can see better. So just take a minute, observe, think about, reflect, so on and so forth. Um, this guy here is the tarsier. Um, we also have our orangutan and our gorilla. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 All right.
right, so um, that's plenty of reflection time. So let's uh, let's reflect back on here. Um, what do we know about the lifestyles of these animals based on their hand shape, based on their body shape, legs of arms, and other objects? Please. They were born for like their um, like their style of life. All right, for one thing, they have tools that help them survive in their environment better, right? That's an assumption we can make. Sure. Like the orangutan's hand is all skinny and long, so it's probably better for him to see the tree so he can swing better. Great, but he's got a hand that's really good at gripping branches and things, right? Can that long fingers can curl around? Hmm? All right, which ones? Sure. What are there, is there one of these hand shapes that doesn't seem like it would be good for climbing. Yeah. Why? What about it doesn't say to you gripping branches? It's so short, and then the palm is really big, but everything else is so small. All right, great. So you have like these stubby little fingers. Look at that thumb. That would you could never grab on anything with that. Be worthless, right? So um, we see here our gorilla is in like a bipedal stance, but generally speaking, how do gorillas walk? They do this knuckle walking thing, right? So. Why would having this extended hand be really good for that lifestyle? Good, right? So like more like gripping onto the ground or something, right? So these are just inferences we're making based on some evidence. Um, tell me about the orangutan's arms. What made made it suited well to its lifestyle? Great, right? And and what and if you're up in those branches, how would a long arm be of service to you? Yeah, I can reach really well for things. Um, how about our, our, our Tessier? So what about its fingers makes it really good at grasping these little twigs and things? Yeah. Um, they're, they're like skinny, so you get like more grip. All right, great. So good at wrapping around little rope-like things? Yeah. And um, I see that when like talking to the tree, they can like move their fingers to get out of their um Good, right? So maybe these little pads, right, have, have a curvature that allows them to do some specialized features. Great. Um, let's move on to the next stage of our notes. These will be our last two words for today. Um, all right, now, we're unique amongst animals because we also have what's known as culture, right? We, we talked about this a little bit in the last uh, chapter, that because we can speak, because we can write, we can transfer information to one another very effectively. Uh, has everyone heard the expression of meme before? Yeah, right? Like a meme is any unit of culture, often a new one, that changes society, that changes an individual's life, right? It could be a word, it could be a symbol, um, it could be a viral video, um, or it could perhaps it's using technology, right, to supplement something you aren't strong with. Perhaps you are a diabetic. What is a medicine that will help keep you going? Insulin. Insulin, right? That's the idea of a meme. They started giving insulin to one person, it worked out okay, now they give it to all diabetics, or depending on your type of diabetes. Um, glasses, right? Glasses are the kind of thing that the first people started wearing them, were able to see better, they were able to function in society better, and then before you know it, they're giving them out to everyone. Right. Has the meme of glasses changed? Yeah. Yeah, now you've got contacts as well, right? Um, let's say I were to say to my class, ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time. Are there people in the room that understand what that means? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right? That's a great example of a meme. So, um, does anyone have a story behind that? Yeah. Please hire So, it was this lady, I don't know where, but she saw a fire. It was in New Orleans. Yeah. So, um, she went to get a soda, and then something, <laughs> she had to leave the building. And yeah. And she was, like, upset by all the commotion and whatnot, right? So, she says this expression, and the expression itself struck people as being humorous, but what was added to it? They turned it into a what? A song, right? They made this whole video and there's like a beat and everything, right? And that became a unit of culture. Most Americans know, ain't nobody got time for that, right? Um, thinking also about adolescents are really good at generating new memes. What's, a, what's an expression you guys, that adolescents started using about four years ago that's become very popular? If you're annoyed with somebody, you say, Annoying is a very common expression. We've yeah. used that for a long time. Get yeah. Aggie, right? Get mad Aggie, right? Uh, that was not something people knew 10 years ago. But enough people used it that now we have what's known as a cultural evolution. Everyone has started using it, right? 
your ninth grade teachers, it's a Friday afternoon, we all go hang out together, and we're like, yo, those kids be mad aggy. Right? Uh, right? So like, we have now, the culture has evolved for everyone to be using it. Society is changing incrementally. Right, so adaptation is the individual unit, and the cultural evolution is when everyone starts doing it. Um, in terms of a really great example of cultural evolution in the past um, couple thousand years, um, is something that's in the news right now. What f famous VIP is in our traveling our country at this moment? The Pope. Oh, the Pope. Um, so, like, see about the Pope? Like, who cares about this guy? Why? Um, so the Pope is like the you know the the vanguard, the pinnacle of Catholicism. Mm. Because it's important for Hispanic and Hispanic um, culture. Because most Hispanics are. Are Catholics. Right, right, and people will listen to him, right, because he's the leader of their religion. Now, Catholicism was the first form of Christianity. The first time Jesus was, like, talked about, worshipped, written about, whatever. And what happened to Catholicism over time? It changed into what? Does anyone know why Ireland, the north of Ireland and the south of Ireland don't like, they don't like each other too much? Um, so, I'm sure we've all heard the expression Protestant before, Protestantism. All right, so Catholic churches, like other big organizations, like schools, like society, have lots of what? Things that people don't like. No one likes obeying the laws, the, laws, the rules, right? Catholicism had lots of rules. You couldn't get divorced. You had to go to church to worship God. You had to give money to the church to support it. And people started getting mad, and they're like, hey, all that matters is I'm a good person, and I have a good relationship with God. I don't need to go to that big fancy building with all the gold statues. So there was this movement, and it became really powerful when there was this king in England, and he wanted to do what with his wife? Divorce her. He wanted to get rid of her. And the Pope was like, you can't divorce your wife. That's against God. So he said what? I'm not going to be this anymore. I'm going to be Protestant. Yeah. And why do some people, like, they wear, like, skirts? Like, and they say it's, like, religious, like, not. Right, so in our, this is a good example, right? In our country, 50 years ago, women did not wear pants, right? Like, it was not culturally acceptable. And men didn't have period. Like, that was, like, totally not the way it went. But over time, someone starts doing it, usually younger people, and it seems cool, and because it's cool, other people start doing it, and then over time, everything changes, right? That's a great example of corruption. Now, today, Protestantism has turned into what? You've got Seventh-day Adventists, you've got Baptists, you've got Mormons, you've got Presbyterians, Episcopals, and all of these groups think that they are what? The best. The best. The only way to God, right? But 2,000 years ago, Catholicism was the only way to commune with Jesus, Jesus and get to God. Who knows, maybe one of them says it that way. Um, right? But then the Protestants came along and they were like, no, there's like this whole other way to worship. Like you just do it like at home and like in your, you know, in your barn. Um, and then all these other ones took their own versions, right? Each has their own little special way of doing it. Um, and that's a great example of cultural evolution. All right, we're going to move on to our activity. Um, all right, so I'll tell you how the rest of the class is going to look. Yeah, we're done with our notes. This is going to go underneath your agenda. First thing we're going to do is watch a short video. Kindly go over your books to page 34, folks. Page 34. Okay, great. 
So they found their skeleton, and we're going to talk a little bit about that now, and uh, we'll move on to this soon. And the little video up there is a little bit hint of where we're going to go with all of this. Um, but for now, we're going to watch this video first, and then we're going to answer some questions. Um, and earlier, I was having some troubles um, getting the internet to work, so hopefully it's all happening.